If your childhood had a theme, what would it sound like? I know mine goes something like this. Okay, that's not exactly a fair statement, because the first console I owned was a Nintendo 64, and you best believe I played the shit out of some Mario, Ocarina of Time, and later on a heavily rented copy of Majora's Mask from the local video rental store. And while my experiences with that are irreplaceable, they would shape what I thought video games could be. When I finally snapped into conscious thought after my Goo Goo Gaga Dumb Kid arc, the console I remember playing the most was the GameCube. And honestly, it was fundamental in shaping some of my fondest childhood memories both by myself and with my friends and forever giving me the debuff that is being a Nintendo fanboy. Honestly, the entire 5th and 6th generation of consoles has a chokehold on my heart and set a lot of standards for gaming going forward, but that's a topic for another time. Today we're just talking about the GameCube. You'd think with such an influential console, it'd be one of the top performing ones of its generation, right? Okay, well, at least it's gotta be one of the best Nintendo consoles. Oh god. No, that couldn't be right. How could that be? Well, let's take a trip down memory lane while I discuss the best parts of this goofy little box, its impact on gaming as a whole, and why it ultimately couldn't square up with the competition. This is the Nintendo GameCube, Nintendo's most underrated console. Before we get into the video though, I have a short announcement. You guys know how much I absolutely love horror games and video game history in general, right? Well, I was recently contacted by the folks over at Creator VC to spread the word about their upcoming project, Terabytes. If you don't know these guys, they do long-form documentary-style videos on media covering the history and evolution of the genre, with behind-the-scenes interviews from some of the big names in the industry. I've personally seen their recent projects FPS and In Search of Darkness, and I can confirm the quality of them is phenomenal, and this type of content is right up my alley, and if you like any of my stuff, I can guarantee that you'll love them as well. Their next project, Terabytes, is an upcoming documentary on the horror gaming genre that features some of the biggest names in horror gaming. They've got interviews from Akira Yamaoka, who did the soundtrack to many of the Silent Hill games, John Romero, who made Doom, Erdorf, the creator of Faith, the developers of Dead by Daylight, Iron Lung, and many, many more. Joining the pre-order campaign gives you all five hour-long episodes of Terabytes, as well as their previous documentary FPS as well. It also includes live Q&As with some of the aforementioned industry legends, and other online events throughout the year, along with some pretty sick merch. I for one can't wait to see it when it's done, that's like 60 hours of horror gaming content. If any of this sounds interesting to you, check them out using the link in the description to support them and support me, and get some pretty sweet perks along with your copy of Terabytes. Thank you for listening to that, now back to the video. The GameCube began development in 1998 as a successor to the 64 under the codename Dolphin, because what screams next-gen powerhouse? Uh, Dolphins, I guess. No, it was actually named after the processor Flipper, which could have just as easily been named after one of these, and you could have called it Project Pancake or something cute, but Dolphins are cool too, I guess. After Sony toppled Nintendo's monopoly on the video game console market with the PlayStation 1, Nintendo needed something a bit more meaty to compete. On top of that, most of the industry was shifting to CDs instead of cartridges, as they're cheaper to produce and can hold much more. So naturally, the lifespan of the 64 was at its end, and its successor would soon begin. And in 2001, we got this. Taking notes from the pretty batty episode of Spongebob, the GameCube launched in a variety of fun colors, with indigo and jet black initially, and a platinum model added shortly after, some places even getting this cool spice orange one. The GameCube was made primarily to compete with the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and hey did you remember this one exist? And is the one that I would consider to be the most game console Nintendo console, as every later product had some sort of gimmick to differentiate it from the competition. Not that this one entirely lacks that Nintendo charm that we all know and, well, no. But as far as design goes, this one is what I would expect a game console to look like. Like, yeah, that's definitely a geometry, and at least it doesn't look like an end table. The same thing applies to the controller, and I hesitate to say this because I can hear the comments now, meaty you big dumb idiot, bad opinion, I only use the Spongebob plug and play controller. But I genuinely think that this controller might be one of the best video game controllers ever made. The placement of the buttons and sticks just works so well, and every game played using this thing just feels intuitive and good, and that might be why it still has support to this day via the Nintendo Switch adapter. And oh boy did this thing have all manner of goofy gizmos and add-ons, but don't worry we'll get there later. Anyway, none of this matters if the game library is bad, and dare I say it, but this had an absolute banger of library, hands f***ing down, with a few stipulations. In an odd decision, the game that they chose as a launch title for this thing to demo the sheer power of the GameCube was not a Mario platformer or a Zelda like you'd expect for a Nintendo launch, but the now classic Luigi's Mansion. Something I don't think anyone saw coming, but it was so well received that it spawned a whole series of these games. 
Think Resident Evil 1, but you're a funny green guy with a vacuum that sucks up ghosts. It's goofy, but the aesthetic and feeling for this game is so unique and fun. On that note, I would consider this era as Nintendo's most experimental phase. They took a lot of risks this generation and tried a bunch of unique approaches to their games, and that's heavily reflected in the absolutely legendary game library. And the fact that they were so lax with their precious IPs this generation, lending them to many third-party developers, which gave us some very bizarre results. We got two mainline Zelda games with completely different art styles that are both outstanding in their own way. The art direction of these still holds up and looks great today, even if it isn't as graphically impressive as games nowadays. Unfortunately, Wind Waker didn't perform as well at launch due to audiences here in the States wanting a more realistic Zelda game. Prior to this, a tech demo was shown of a realistic styled Link and Ganon having a sword fight and then Nintendo slaps him with his Studio Ghibli looking ass boy. It was a bit divisive. Some praised how expressive this Link is and generally how good the art style is as a whole, but others at the time thought it was too childish. Which is why, with Twilight Princess, they went back to a more realistic art style, which commercially did do much better. And while I do love them both, I think Twilight Princess shows its age more than Wind Waker in most respects. As far as other big Nintendo titles for the GameCube go, we got a successor to the groundbreaking Mario 64, where two minutes in, you're arrested and thrown in jail, you obtain a water jetpack, and you stop a turtle with mommy issues from committing eco-terrorism. Say what you want about Mario Sunshine, but it maybe had the tightest controlling movement in a Mario game to date. And while it seems to be the most divisive game, it's one of my personal favorites, and it has a vibe that's just unrivaled by the rest of the series. I boot this up and it feels like I'm on summer vacation in high school all over again. We got two Pokemon games not even made by the Pokemon company that are maybe the closest to a traditional RPG in the series. I mean, look at this dude's hair. You only get shit that stupid in an RPG. You play as this Hot Topic employee that steals other people's Pokemon, a concept not seen in a Pokemon game to this day. And while there's some odd gameplay decisions like not having a lot of Pokemon encounters, it does have one of the most charming and unique maps and, might I say, one of the best soundtracks to boot. We also got a Kirby racing game, a Metroid FPS, new IPs like Pikmin and Luigi's Mansion, the most unique Mario Kart, the most competitive Smash Bros, an array of Mario sports spin-offs, like four different Mario Party entries. The list of certified gems on this thing is endless. That's not even counting the several Zelda collector's discs that had the previously unreleased Master Quest Ocarina of Time version, Majora's Mask, and that weird gimmicky shit like Four Swords Adventure that used the Game Boy Link cable. It also had the ability to play pretty much the whole library of Game Boy Advance games via the Game Boy Player. The Game Boy Player was this add-on for the cube that attaches to the bottom and has a slot for Game Boy games, which functionally just gives you a bigger screen for your Game Boy games. The GameCube had a lot of these goofy accessories made for it at the time, usually specific to certain games such as the bongos for the Donkey Kong Rhythm game, or in the case of the Game Boy Link Cable, it was a feature for a wide array of games that just added a little extra stuff to it. You could become the Unabomber and the Wind Waker at the cost of all your hard-earned rupees, the Chow Garden had some fun little mini-games when connected to the GBA, but apart from Four Swords Adventure, this thing really didn't see a ton of use, but it was a pretty novel concept. Not many people use these things just due to the high cost of entry. You had to buy like three separate pieces of hardware for a very minuscule payoff. However, having access to the whole library of GBA games was probably enough of a selling point at the time to justify at least getting the Game Boy Player. And hey, on the upside, I didn't have to get this stupid looking antenna light for my Game Boy to see the screen now. Clearly, there was no shortage of fantastic first party titles for this thing. But what about third party support? Well, uh, got a bunch of sports titles nobody cares about. Jokes aside, the third-party support for the GameCube wasn't as bad as everyone claims. Available at launch, we had Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, some very fondly remembered entries in their respective series, as well as Crazy Taxi and the absolute GOAT Super Monkey Ball. On the topic of Monkey Ball, a former rival decided to become one of Nintendo's biggest allies for this console generation and onward. After dropping out of the console market, Sega decided to become a third-party developer and go hard with support for the GameCube. We got a port of almost every mainline Sonic for this thing, with both of the Sonic Adventure games, two collections containing most of the classic Sonic games, Sonic Heroes, Sonic Riders, and oh fuck they gave him a gun. This is where a lot of people, myself included, became fans of the series. We even got one of the best licensed games ever with Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom. The GameCube got a shockingly large amount of these TV and movie licensed games, and while 99% of them were hot dog water, this is one of the ones that's fondly remembered by most. Heavy Iron Studios struck gold on this game, so much so that we got a remastered version a few years ago. You could say objectively these games aren't great, but as far as TV show tie-in games go, this one was very charming and well done. There's a reason that this one got a remaster, and you don't hear anyone clamoring for a remaster of the Cars video game. Okay, meaty, that's cool and all, but what if I don't feel like playing games designed for furries or fetuses? 
Well, have no fear, despite Nintendo being known for family-friendly games, they tried really hard to make more games available for the edgy and mature audiences for this thing. In that regard, we got Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, Soul Calibur 2, with the GameCube exclusively having Link as a playable character, and then our cult classic Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, which is often regarded as one of the best horror games ever made, and the first ever rated M game published by Nintendo, with the second also being a game made for the GameCube with Geist. Geist is this weird first-person shooter where you play as a ghost possessing different things and completing levels. It's nothing outstanding by today's standards, but it's a really unique take on the first-person shooter, and just such an odd thing for Nintendo to publish. It seems like something so far outside of their comfort zone, but it seems like they were also just throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks here. Finally, you can't discuss third-party support without talking about the Capcom 5. These were five games that were supposed to be exclusive to the GameCube, that were developed by Capcom in order to bolster sales to the failing GameCube and show everyone, see, you can make games for this thing. Of those five, PNO3 was the only one to stay exclusive to the Cube. Dead Phoenix was cancelled, Beautiful Joe and Killer7 were released on other platforms, and the now legendary Resident Evil 4 was eventually ported to every system known to man. It's odd to think about, but Resident Evil 4 was originally set to be a GameCube exclusive. The loss of these would be one of the biggest contributors to the eventual downfall of the GameCube. You may be thinking, alright meaty, you charismatic, vaguely pasta mascot looking boy, you've sold me. The GameCube did have a banger library, so why did it fail so hard at the time? Well, the way I see it, it comes down to three things. The size of the disc, the lack of features, and the stiff competition. The GameCube at the time was far cheaper than the competition, at a modest $199 at launch, which was a whole hundred dollars cheaper than the competition, and later the price was cut even more to $99. Surprisingly, it was also more powerful in terms of hardware, too. However, the discs were actually what limited it the most. Nintendo was terrified of their games getting pirated, some things never change, so they created these mini-sized discs that made it harder to reproduce. And while that does make it harder, it also severely limits what you can do with them. They could only hold about 1.4 gigabytes worth of stuff, as opposed to the standard sized discs that the competition was using which held about 4.7. This means that the cube was also harder to develop games for, and even when porting games to it, they had to strip down the game or cut features or content just to get it to fit on the disc. This means for multi-platform releases that the GameCube version was just a strictly less good version of the game, which did show in sales and ratings across the board. Due to these limitations, many third-party developers weren't equipped to make games under these kind of restrictions, so the brunt of releases had to be good first-party games. On top of that, the GameCube lacked features that many at the time considered standard. The Xbox and PlayStation 2 had built-in DVD players, so you could do everything with one device. The Xbox also basically pioneered online multiplayer, and while the GameCube had an online adapter, I'm convinced a total of zero people actually owned these. I swear the shit's a psyop designed by Miyamoto himself. But far and away the biggest reason the GameCube sold so poorly is just how great this era for gaming was. The Xbox, as previously mentioned, made online multiplayer the next big thing, and the PlayStation 2 had like every game ever release on it, and to this day is the best selling console of all time. It was just hard to compete with everything else when the bar was set so stupidly high which is still honestly saying a lot when the worst performing option is still as amazing as this. The legacy of the GameCube is undeniable. Many staple franchises of Nintendo made their debut on this thing, and many of the most memorable or unique entries of existing series were developed for it. It was arguably Nintendo's most innovative point as a game developer, and I think it's a shame it didn't work out better for them, as the library of games we got for it is unrivaled even to this day. The Wii and the Switch have some decent games, but they don't hold a candle to the Goat Cube. I believe it's after this point that Nintendo started trying less to compete with others and more of trying to do their own thing, always putting their own unique gimmicky spin on things with the Wii and DS onward, for better or worse. The GameCube may have underperformed at the time, and maybe not everyone agrees with this, but I personally owe a lot of my childhood to it, and it cemented me as a Nintendo fan despite seeing the obvious flaws with it. It had something for everyone, whether that be one of the many outstanding single-player games, or the vast amount of party games for it. Even if some experiences were technically less good versions of others, they made sure you at least had options on this thing, and I can't respect that decision enough. So thank you Nintendo for making my childhood great, thank you Magical Geometry Cube for the countless hours of fun for me and my friends, and thank you viewer for listening to my poorly structured rant about Nintendo's most underrated console. Hey there, thanks for watching another one of my videos. If you enjoyed it and you want to see more stuff like it, leaving a like and subscribing helps the channel out a lot, and I would really appreciate it. If you want to see more of my stuff, I have playlists in the end cards in the description if you want to check those out too. I do a variety of gaming related stuff, so you might find other stuff you like there. I'd also like to hear you guys' thoughts in the comments. Your thoughts on the video itself, if it's like a format that you guys enjoy or not. 
or if you'd rather, you can share a memory of your own experience with the GameCube or your thoughts on it. Maybe you've got a favorite game or whatever. I personally love rambling about niche video game related stuff in like a loose structured essay like this, and coming off that hour long monstrosity I made last video, doing a few of these shorter more relaxed videos is nice. Either way, I just like making stuff for you guys to hopefully enjoy. Thanks once again for watching, it really means the most. Have a good one, and I will see you next time.